Welcome to the Political Institutions and Political Economy Pipe Workshop at the Bedrosian Center here in the Price School at the University of Southern California. I'm Jeff Jenkins, the director of the Bedrosian Center and the Price Collaborative. Our workshop speaker today is Adi Dasgupta. Adi is an assistant professor of political science at the University of California, Merced. His research is on comparative political and economic history and development. He focuses on three main topics, democratization, technological change, and state capacity. Much of his work is on rural India, including a book project on the political consequences of technological change. Other work examines the historical and organizational roots of why parties succeed or fail at incorporating new groups and democratizing societies. He's currently building a lab on the political economy of agriculture and rural societies, pairs. Adi's presentation today is entitled Explaining Rural Conservatism, Technological and Political Change in the Great Plains. Following the presentation, we'll have a formal discussant, Brian Leonard from Arizona State University to provide some comments. During Adi's talk, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat or Q&A box. I'll be monitoring questions as the talk goes on. And without further ado, I give you Adi Dasgupta. Um, thanks so much for the kind introduction, Jeff, and for having me at this seminar. Um, and thanks everyone uh, here for attending and Brian especially um, for his comments. Let me just share my screen. So this is a paper um, that's co-authored uh, with Eleanor Ramirez, a graduate student in our department at the University of California, Merced. Um, the paper's title is Explaining Rural Conservatism, Political Consequences of Technological Change in the Great Plains. Um, and what we're doing in this paper is kind of utilizing a natural experiment um, to study the roots of how rural America became so conservative and in particular to highlight the role of technological change um, in this process in the 20th century. Um, so let me begin with the question that this project addresses, um, which is the historical rise of rural conservatism. Okay. So today in the United States, uh, as well as other capitalist, advanced capitalist economies, um, rural areas are conservative electoral strongholds. Um, so they're solidly conservative constituencies typically, um, and especially given the institutional overrepresentation of rural areas in sort of political systems, the countryside represents a critical source of support for right-wing parties, um, in the case of the United States, the Republican Party. Um, we kind of take that uh, as granted um, today, but this is not always the case historically. Um, and in fact, in the past, in the early 20th century, the late 19th century, um, US farmers often supported left-wing and populist parties and politicians. Okay. Um, so what we ask in this project is, given this historical context, what explains the long-term rise of rural conservatism in the United States? Um, and we think this is an important question um, that's critical for understanding a critical feature of contemporary politics, uh, which is, you know, the well-known um, rural-urban divide. Okay. Um, so just to give you a sense of what, uh, of how politics in the Great Plains, um, the region that we're looking at in this paper, was not always so conservative, um, I wanted to show this plot of the distribution of uh, sort of uh, the success of the populist party, um, the kind of left-wing populist agrarian party that emerged in the late 19th, early 20th century in the United States. Um, the populist party found some of its greatest successes in the Great Plains states, like Kansas, Colorado, Nebraska, South Dakota, electing members of Congress and governors um, from several of these states. Yeah. Um, the Populist Party, of course, was fairly left-wing in its politics. It called for a nationalization of the railroads, uh, various forms of redistribution, the abandonment of the gold standard in favor of the silver standard, and other policies intended to favor um, poor and indebted farmers. So at one point in time, the politics of the Great Plains were quite, um, you know, there was space for fairly left-wing politics. Okay. Um, so... Great Plains states like Nebraska produced several sort of well-known left-wing politicians, uh, perhaps most famously William Jennings Bryan, uh, the famous populist leader from Nebraska, and this is a picture of him giving his famous kind of uh, fiery uh, cross of gold speech in 1896. 
Fast forward about 100 years later, um, Nebraska is one of the most conservative states in the United States. Uh, Donald Trump won there in a landslide in 2020. You might say these are both populists, um, but populists of completely different stripes, left wing in the case of Brian and right wing in the case of Trump. Um, another way of thinking about uh, the long-term conservative transformation uh, of rural areas in the United States, particularly in the Great Plains, um, is through county level data on the Republican Party's share of the two-party vote. Um, in two periods here, in the left-hand side panel, this is uh, averaging uh, the Republican Party's share of the vote in presidential elections between 1920 and 1940. And on the right-hand side is the average between 1980 and 2000. Um, so what you can see here is that uh, the Great Plains have gone from a region that was mostly purple, kind of um, you know, fairly centrist in its political orientation, uh, to one that looks fairly like a sea of red, um, that is a deeply conservative region um, in presidential elections. Um, and in this paper, we try to understand how this transformation came about in the 20th century. Um, we're not, of course, the first ones to puzzle over this question. Um, perhaps the best known book which kind of uh, addressed this question is this famous book by Thomas Frank, which came out in 2007, I think, entitled, What's the Matter with Kansas? Um, and in this book, Frank was kind of trying to understand uh, why does a poor and rural state like Kansas vote for the conservative Republican Party, um, seemingly against the interests of poor voters in these rural areas? Um, Frank's explanation hinged on the kind of culture wars and the role of polarizing social issues in distracting poor voters from issues of redistribution. Um, Kathy Kramer, while she doesn't look at the Great Plains specifically, she has this fantastic book on the politics of resentment, which tries to understand the roots of rural conservatism in the US uh, and the way in which it's connected to a distinctive kind of uh, rural identity that views uh, city folk and government in kind of adversarial terms. Um, the deeper question though is how did that kind of rural identity or a sense of rural consciousness, as she puts it, um, emerge in the first place um, when seemingly it didn't exist in the early 20th century? Um, and we're gonna argue that technological change played an important role um, in this process. Okay. Um, so existing explanations for the rise of rural conservatism often emphasize the culture wars or identity-based political polarization, especially since the 1970s and 1980s. Um, other explanations, for example, Jonathan Robbins' book on why cities lose, kind of treat agriculture as a backwards sector in the economy that's left behind by technological change in the knowledge economy in cities, which leads to the emergence of kind of liberal and cosmopolitan politics in urban areas, but um, leaves the countryside behind as a kind of conservative residual sector. Um, what we argue is that major, you know, tech, major technological changes took place in the 20th century in the agricultural sector too. Uh, and these new technologies made new politics in the countryside. Um, in particular, technological change made agriculture increasingly capital intensive. Um, and it kind of changed the class structure of farming from small family farms to increasingly large scale capital intensive farms, um, you know, which uh, I'm going to term agribusiness. Um, and that the growing economic and political power of these agribusiness interests in rural areas um, has played an important role in the conservative transformation of rural political preferences. Okay. Um, and I'm just previewing what I'll you know, talk about in greater depth now. Um, empirically, what we do to study or test this argument is to exploit a historical natural experiment, um, which is the post-war introduction of new irrigation technologies in the Great Plains, uh, namely improved groundwater pumps based on the adaptation of automobile engines, uh, as well as center pivot irrigation, a method of irrigating large circular fields with a rotating arm. Uh, what these new technologies did is that it enabled farmers to profitably irrigate otherwise arid land in the Great Plains. But this was a technology that primarily benefited counties with access to groundwater uh, as a result of overlap with the Ogallala Aquifer, a major aqu uh, aquifer in the region. Okay. 
So this provides a kind of natural experiment uh, and an opportunity to study the evolution of politics across counties that were differentially imp impacted by this post-war technological shock um, using a diff in diff design, um, as well as spatial matching. So we're only comparing counties along the boundary of this Ogallala aquifer. Uh, using this design, I'll show that this technological shock played a large role in the region's long-term conservative electoral shift in different types of elections. Uh, we'll also look at geocoded survey data um, from uh, you know, contemporary surveys and show that even today, uh, contemporary policy preferences systematically differ between people who live just inside the aquifer, where capital intensive agriculture thrives because of this post-war technological shock compared to people just outside. Okay. So with that, let me um, just jump into the context here, um, which is, you know, how did technology and politics co-evolve in the Great Plains in the 20th century? Okay. Um, so the Great Plains basically refers to this geographical region, um, a broad expanse of grassland that stretches in the south from Texas all the way up to the Dakotas. Um, it was first ex extensively settled by family farms as a result of the Homestead Act of 1862, uh, which encouraged families to settle um, and uh, develop uh, agricultural land west of the Mississippi River with a promise of property rights if they could show proof of having uh, developed uh, the land. Uh, the Great Plains is a naturally arid region with fairly volatile precipitation, um, and so it's not well suited in the absence of irrigation to intensive farming. Um, intensive farming uh, combined with drought, in fact, resulted in the well-known Dust Bowl of the 1930s, a period of drought and dust storms, which basically caused um, agricultural collapse and mass out-migration. Okay. If we're looking at the politics of this region prior to World War II, um, I would characterize it as eclectic and on the whole centrist, um, tending to mirror national trends. For example, during the period of national Republican Party dominance in the 19th century, the Great Plains tended to vote Republican too, um, especially because of the Republican Party's support for the westward expansion of the railways. Um, towards the end of the 19th century and early 20th century, um, left-wing politics found great success in the Great Plains, um, in particular in the form of the Populist Party, um, as well as FDR's New Deal, um, one of the core constituencies of which um, were the small family farms, these precarious homesteads and small producers who benefited a lot from the system of agricultural safety nets um, that the New Deal created. Um, so this is what a kind of typical farm, you know, in the Great Plains prior to this technological shock that I'm talking about might have looked like. Um, uh, labor was supplied primarily by the household. Um, to the extent that there was irrigation, it was primarily from these windmill pumps, right, which were not suitable for provi providing irrigation on a large scale. It provided just about enough water for the household and livestock. Um, and uh, generally, these farms were not particularly profitable. Um, these lands were fairly marginal um, and not very productive. Okay. Um, but following World War II, uh, Two interrelated set of innovations transformed agriculture in the Great Plains. Okay. Um, the first was the replacement of the windmill pump with petroleum powered groundwater pumps. So deep well pumps that are powered by uh, petroleum and natural gas engines, which can for the first time efficiently large, lift large volumes of water from um, aquifers in the Great Plains. Um, so initially this was based on the adaptation of automobile engines to the task of lifting um, groundwater. Uh, the second closely related innovation was the invention of center pivot irrigation in 1940. This is a sprinkler based system of distribution of water from a central well across extremely large circular fields with a rotating arm, um, which could be up to a kilometer in diameter or perhaps even more sometimes. Okay. Um, so it was invented in 1940, patented in 1952, and spread widely across the Great Plains from the 1950s onward. If you fly across the Great Plains, you'll see these big circular uh, irrigated fields. That's a result of um, center pivot irrigation. 
Um, these two innovations had dramatic consequences. Um, they turned parts of the Great Plains into highly industrialized water and capital intensive farming based on the cultivation of water intensive crops like corn, um, animal feedlots, which often use uh, a lot of water, um, often the equivalent of a small sized city, um, as well as related agricultural industries like meatpacking plants, you know, which um, you know, kind of downstream in the supply chain from um, feedlots um, and uh, farms which prov provide um, hay and things for animals. Um, and so these two innovations basically turned a region that had been arid into um, one of the most uh, industrialized and productive in the world. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, just some imagery of what these new technologies that I'm talking about look like. Um, on the left-hand side, this is the patent for Frank Zybach's uh, center pivot irrigation, um, a central well to which a rotating arm is connected and it distributes water um, across a circular field. Um, this is an image uh, of a typical kind of uh, petroleum powered pumping system, uh, in this case, based on a rebuilt uh, V8 automobile engine um, in 1988. And so with the introduction of uh, these new technologies, right, farming takes on a scale uh, far greater um, than had previously existed uh, in this region. So we're no longer talking about small, unproductive family farms. We're talking about highly mechanized, large scale farms um, with the market value of which is often quite high. Um, so this is what a center pivot irrigation system looks like. You can get a sense of just how massive um, these installations are. Um, and so with uh, the growing capital intensity of agriculture uh, came a change in the kind of class structure of um, rural areas. Um, so these are a couple of quotations from studies of uh, the Great Plains. Um, the first is a study of Haskell County in Kansas, um, where sociologists visited this county in 1965, shortly after the introduction of these new irrigation technologies. Um, and they noted that farming had become agribusiness and business considerations were dominant throughout the thinking of the farm community. The average size farm of 1200 acres represented a considerable capital outlay and rising operating costs were all but eliminating the marginal farmer in 1965. Uh, the environmental historian, John Opie, he has a fantastic book on um, the Ogallala Aquifer. He also kind of makes the same point as irrigation brought prosperity to the high plains, Smaller farmers were pushed out of the way. The shift from the family farm towards large scale centralized agribusiness operations can be compared to the demise of mine pond neighborhood grocery stores after World War II as supermarkets became commonplace. Okay. Um, and with this changing kind of structure of the agricultural sector um, came big changes in rural political preferences. Um, and so Elena, Elena and I uh, identified kind of three interrelated mechanisms through which the emergence of capital intensive agriculture and agribusiness in the Great Plains uh, made rural politics increasingly conservative. Um, the first is opposition to regulation uh, of, uh, on the part of these new interests. Um, these large scale farms are intensive users of land and water. Um, there's often toxic runoff that comes off of feedlots and other large scale agricultural operations. Uh, and so agribusiness often finds itself in opposition to environmental regulation as, other, as well as other forms of land use regulation. And as a result, it tends to favor a small government. Um, and that makes it a natural ally of the pro-business Republican Party's kind of anti-regulation orientation. Um, as farmers have became, become more prosperous, um, and agribusiness operators too. Um, they've taken on uh, the kind of polit standard political preferences of uh, wealthy and business oriented voters, uh, which is to prefer pro-business tax and spending policies. For instance, they're gonna prefer lower taxes, less redistribution. Um, they're also gonna favor an agricultural subsidy system that is less oriented around um, safety nets for small producers and one that tends to uh, and they tend to prefer um, a system that concentrates subsidies in the largest producers. Um, something we might worry about as well, you know, wealthy farmers and agribusiness operators are going to be a relatively small um, minority in rural areas. Um, 
We argue, though, that uh, the spread of capital-intensive agriculture led to a conservative transformation of rural political culture that kind of transcended just wealthy farmers. Um, uh, the reason for this was the outsized kind of economic and cultural influence uh, of farmers in rural areas in the Great Plains. Um, and so basically what center pivot irrigation and these new groundwater pumps did is they created a post-war economic boom, which sustained the kind of entire livelihoods of rural communities, which depended on it. Uh, so even if you're not a wealthy farmer or you're not someone who um, owns an agribusiness operation, you may never, nevertheless, you know, out of a sense of linked fate, kind of internalize their interests too. And all these things together um, led to an increasingly conservative political orientation um, and the growing success of the conservative um, Republican party in elections. Okay. So let me kind of illustrate these points uh, through the lens of a single county in rural Kansas, um, Haskell County, which is a county just inside the boundaries of the Ogallala Aquifer. Uh, it's an interesting county because rural sociologists have been revisiting this county uh, to conduct rural community studies over a 50 year period. That spans the period prior to the introduction of these new technologies, as well as the period following the introduction. Um, and in these kind of ethnographies, you can see how politics has changed in a conservative direction with the spread of um, these new irrigation technologies. Okay. So the first uh, sociologist to visit uh, Haskell County um, in the study on the left was Earl Bell, um, who in 1942 found a county that had been hard hit by the Dust Bowl, uh, which was poor and precarious, um, and uh, which he described as being characterized by a gambling mentality, because no one could tell whether the rains were going to fail or uh, arrive in a given year. So it was kind of this boom and bust uh, kind of economy. Uh, and in this kind of precarious and poor context, uh, Attitudes towards government were fairly favorable. Um, for example, he noted that everyone interviewed was unanimous of the opinion that, as one man said, if it had not been for the government program, we would not be here now. We simply could not have made it. Okay. Fast forward 20 years, 25 years later, um, another sociologist revisits Haskell County, but this time uh, irrigation technologies have arrived and are widespread in the county. Um, and agribusiness has now spread um, throughout the county. Farming is increasingly prosperous. Uh, it no longer depends on rainfall because it's powered by groundwater. Uh, and this leads to a total shift in attitudes among farmers. The Haskell County operator believes that he has won through his present day success by virtue of his own efforts. If the government will remove its many controls, he can grow abundantly all that the country needs and receive good prices for his produce. So there's a shift in uh, belief about success as being linked to luck versus effort, as well as a kind of corresponding shift in attitudes towards the government as a valuable source of safety nets to something that's a hindrance. Uh, fast forward another three decades uh, in the 1990s, um, uh, a team of sociologists found that basically today, anti-government attitudes are widespread in Haskell County. Um, agribusiness is dominant. Uh, and when people, residents were asked about problems facing the community, the two most frequently mentioned issues were increasing taxation and loss of control to the state and federal governments. Uh, so this kind of characteristic anti-government mentality that is so uh, representative of contemporary rural consciousness uh, in Kathy Kramer's work. Um, so you can see how politics and political culture evolved in Haskell County alongside these technological changes. Um, this is a picture of the county seat of Haskell County uh, in 1954. Uh, this is aerial imagery. Um, and you can see that this is an early stage where uh, irrigation is yet to be widespread, although perhaps it was just beginning to spread. This is what Haskell County looks like in 2006. You can see these big green circles, uh, the center pivot irrigation. That's our kind of storyline about how, uh, you know, technological change made rural areas so conservative. Um, so let me turn now to how we test the argument empirically. Okay. So the key source of identification 
um, in our empirical strategy is that the new irrigation technologies which arrived after World War II uh, required access to groundwater, um, the main source of which in the Great Plains was the Ogallala Aquifer, um, one of the largest aquifers in the world, which spans eight of the 10 Great Plains states. Okay. Um, so counties have different degrees of overlap with the Ogallala Aquifer. And what this means is we can compare election outcomes before and after the post-war technological shock across counties with more versus less aquifer coverage in a difference in differences framework um, where we're exploiting cross-sectional variation in aquifer coverage together with time variation arising from the post-war introduction of this new technology. Um, and we're gonna look at electoral data that spans the period 1920 to 2000 um, in presidential, gubernatorial, and Senate elections. Um, to further augment uh, the empirical strategy, we're gonna do um, some spatial matching, uh, where we're going to, in our preferred specifications, limit the sample to counties along the boundary of the Ogallala Aquifer within a certain buffer, um, either 100 or 200 kilometers around the outer boundary of the aquifer, and also control for state and time, state time period fixed effects. Um, so what this means is our estimates are gonna be driven by overtime comparisons among spatially proximate counties within the same state with different levels of aquifer coverage comparing before and after the technological shock. Okay. So I'll illustrate um, this with a few pictures. Okay. Um, the first thing to sort of establish though is that uh, technology adoption really was somewhat discontinuous around the boundaries of the Ogallala Aquifer. Um, and so in order to validate that, uh, we used tools from computer vision and machine learning um, to take satellite imagery of the Great Plains um, and detect uh, these signature circular cropping patterns in satellite imagery. Um, and so what we did is we trained a convolutional neural network, uh, which is a machine learning algorithm uh, to detect center pivot irrigation um, systems. Um, in the rectangular grids, which characterize property parcels in the American West to the uh, public land survey system. Okay. So in order to train this model, um, we used an existing manually annotated data set that a team of the researchers at the University of Nebraska uh, assembled over many decades where they hand counted from satellite imagery um, individual circles of center pivot irrigation in the case of Nebraska. So they would count uh, and make a note of the latitude and longitude points of these circles. Uh, that gives us a big training data set where we can feed our convolutional neural network uh, different snippets of satellite imagery uh, where it's labeled. Uh, this uh, snippet contains three circles. This snippet contains one circle. This snippet contains two circles and so forth. So we have about 160,000 training images which we train this convolutional neural network with so that we can feed it new images out of sample, you know, outside of Nebraska and in multiple years. And it'll learn to predict and count how many center pivot irrigation systems there are in each of these grids. Okay. So this is what this kind of looks like in the case of Haskell in the year 2000. Uh, Haskell is divided into many PLLS, PLSS uh, sections, these rectangular grids. And in each grid, our algorithm is able to predict the number of center pivot irrigation systems in each section, typically ranging from one to four. We can then aggregate, we can do this for the entire state of Kansas, for example. We do this for the whole Great Plains in every year from 1985 to the year 2000. Um, what this shows us is the year 2000 in Kansas. Um, and for all of the 100,000 or so sections in Kansas, uh, the number of center pivot irrigation systems um, in each of these pixels. Each pixel is one of these PLSS sections. So blue indicates more, uh, green and blue in indicates more uh, center pivot irrigation, red indicates none. Um, what you'll see is that center pivot irrigation is overwhelmingly concentrated within the boundaries of the Ogallala Aquifer, which are seen here in light blue. Okay. We can aggregate this up to the county level and normalize by land area. So we get a measure of center pivot irrigation systems per thousand square kilometers. Here we can see at the county level too that counties with greater overlap with the Ogallala Aquifer um, have systematically higher levels of technology adoption. Yeah. 
there's a lot of work uh, to say that basically we think uh, that our identification strategy is plausible. <laughs> okay. Um, so we also want to uh, refine the empirical strategy further, right? Um, it doesn't just suffice to compare counties with more or less uh, overlap with the Ogallala Aquifer, um, because you might be comparing counties that are far away from one another, right? We might think that comparing a county all the way up here in Northeast Kansas might be fundamentally different than one in the Southwest, right? For you know, a number of reasons which lead to systematically different kind of trajectories in uh, their voting patterns. Um, so what we do in our preferred specifications is prune the sample to counties within a certain uh, buffer distance of the outer boundary of the Ogallala Aquifer. This ensures that there are different diff analyses. We're comparing spatially proximate counties within the same state. Um, we do this with 200 kilometer uh, buffers as well as with 100 kilometer buffers. Okay. This is just to give you a sense of the counties that are going to be that we're going to be comparing um, in our empirical analysis. Yeah. Um, and so we can get a sense of the empirical strategy here from a simple scatter plot. Um, what this scatter plot shows in the left hand side panel is counties in the Great Plains in the 200 kilometer buffer sample. Um, on the x-axis is uh, county level aquifer coverage, share of county land that overlaps the, uh, the Ogallala aquifer. Um, and on the y-axis is the Republican Party's share of the two-party vote in presidential elections. Uh, in the pre-technological shock period, 1920 to 1940 average here, and in the post-technological shock period, 1980 to 2000 period here. Uh, in both cases, we're partialing out state uh, fixed effects. So uh, we're comparing, uh, we're partialing out state specific means on both axes, okay. So if we look at the left-hand side panel, what this is telling us is that uh, prior to the post-war technology shock, there was no association between aquifer coverage and conservative voting in presidential elections. Um, for illustrative purposes, the counties in Kansas are shaded in black. So within Kansas, Counties with more aquifer coverage were no more conservative than counties with less. So Haskell County is pretty middle of the road in its politics as far as Republican Party voting goes in this period. In the post-shock period, though, uh, we see this large positive association that emerges. So a county like Haskell, right, which benefited a lot from this post-war irrigation technology shock, uh, is by the 1980s to 2000 period, one of the most conservative counties in Kansas um, compared to other counties with less irrigation coverage. Um, and we argue that this is plausibly because of the post-war technology shock that disproportionately benefited these counties with greater overlap with the aquifer. Um, so this is just to show you that in pictures, uh, we can also turn to regression estimates, which basically just uh, estimate OLS regressions, uh, where county level aquifer coverage interacted with a post technology shock dummy variable. And we have a pre period corresponding to the 1920 to 1940 average in elections and a post period corresponding to the 1980 to 2000 average in elections in presidential, senatorial, and gubernatorial elections. Um, don't be dominated by this like sea of coefficients. I'll just interpret this preferred specification right here, okay? This is uh, the sample with a 200 kilometer buffer um, and state year fixed effects. Uh, what this difference in difference coefficient right here is telling us is that a county with complete aquifer coverage compared to a county with no aquifer coverage experienced about a 9.5 percentage point increase in the Republican Party's share of the two party vote in presidential elections from the pre to the post technology shock period. A pretty large effect. Um, in the case of uh, elections to the Senate, this is a 7.6 percentage point uh, relative increase. Uh, and in the case of gubernatorial elections, this is 6.3 percentage point increase. Um, we're estimating two types of standard errors, which address spatial and temporal autocorrelation. So we have commonly standard errors here and clustered standard errors here, which adjust for clustering within state years and within counties over time. And here we're also only using the set of counties that have the same boundaries over this entire period, um, 1920 to 2000. Okay. 
Um, so these are pretty big coefficients, right? A 9.5 percentage point swing in a presidential election is a big boost to the Republican Party's electoral performance. Um, something that's interesting about these coefficients is that across specifications, um, the effect tends to be bigger on conservative voting. Uh, the technological shock seems to lead to a bigger conservative shift in more national than in more local elections. So a bigger swing in presidential than in gubernatorial elections. Um, this is plausibly, we think, uh, because the Democratic Party perhaps is better able to adjust its platform in more local elections to win over kind of the farmers and rural voters in a way that's less possible in national elections where the two parties' platforms are more sharply polarized. Um, but that's our kind of working hypothesis. Okay. Um, was this plausibly due to greater uptake of irrigation technology in place, counties with greater aquifer coverage? Um, yes. Um, what this is showing us here is that count, a county with complete aquifer coverage compared to a county with no aquifer coverage, experienced about a 14 percentage point increase in the share of irrigated farmland from the pre-shock to the post-shock period um, compared to a county with no aquifer coverage, a big impact. So irrigation did spread much more widely in these areas as they were becoming more conservative. We can look at the number of center pivot irrigation systems per thousand square kilometers accounted from satellite imagery. Same story in a county with complete aquifer coverage compared to one with no aquifer coverage in the same state within 200 kilometers uh, of this boundary. Uh, from the pre to the post shock period, you see an additional 21 center pivot irrigation systems per thousand square kilometers, which is um, a, a huge um, number relative to the sample mean. Something we might be concerned about is the timing of these effects. Um, is, this, is this conservative shift which took place in counties with greater overlap with the Ogallala Aquifer, is this something that actually emerged with the post-war technology shock or were they always already kind of drifting in a conservative direction, potentially violating the parallel trends assumption in difference and differences um, designs? Um, to look at this, we basically take a full county year, uh, county election year panel data set from 1910 to 2000. Uh, and we uh, interact the aquifer coverage variable um, with decade old dummy variables uh, and leave out the 1930s as a reference category. So we look at uh, cross-sectional associations between aquifer coverage uh, in different decades relative to the 1930s, the decade prior to the introduction of the new technology. Um, and what we seem to see is that in presidential, Senate, and gubernatorial elections, there is little kind of trend or association between aquifer coverage and vote conservative voting and the decades prior to the post-war uh, irrigation technology shock. But it's precisely in the 1940s and 1950s that the big positive uh, relationship between aquifer coverage and conservative voting tends to emerge. And this corresponds exactly um, to this uptick in irrigation. Um, so this is measured from agricultural censuses. Uh, this is uh, the association, the decadal association between aquifer coverage uh, and the percentage of irrigated farmland, which increases as we would expect only once technologies become available to harness the groundwater in the Ogallala aquifer. So, yeah. So something we can look at is different channels here. Um, so this is measured from agricultural uh, and population censuses. All variables are scaled by one plus or minus one standard deviation. Uh, of their in-sample um, values, um, so we can get a sense of comparative magnitudes. Uh, so let's look at some different potential channels. Um, this is exactly the same thing, looking at the association between aquifer coverage and different outcomes in different decades over time relative to the 1930s. The first is the average value per farm in thousands of inflation adjusted dollars. Um, we see that there's no association between aquifer coverage and the value uh, market value of farms. Uh, but this big spike that emerges following the 1940s, at its height in the 1970s, uh, the typical farm was almost $500,000 uh, more valuable in a county with complete aquifer coverage than in a typical farm in a county with no aquifer coverage. Uh, the density of farms, the relative density of farms also increases following this post-war technology shock. So if you multiply these two things, the value per farm and the farms per thousand acres, 
uh, you basically find that following this post-war irrigation technology shock, uh, the economic value of agriculture greatly increases in places with greater um, overlap with the Ogallala Aquifer. It's becoming more capital intensive. Um, by contrast, we don't see evidence for other potential channels, like um, you know, the percentage of the population employed in agriculture um, does increase in relative terms, um, but it's not a huge effect. Uh, we might think that these places are becoming more rural, you know, as agriculture is intensified in these areas, but that's not really the case. Um, population density decreases by a minuscule amount, you know, in places with more aquifer coverage relative to less. And in places with greater aquifer coverage, we actually see a relative increase in urbanization. Um, the number of people living in, the percentage of the population living in cities uh, due to the emergence of small towns and areas of intensive agriculture. So this is not just the story of depopulation or increasing rurality. Um, is it a story about just uh, the increasing kind of religiosity or, of these areas that's making them more conservative? Uh, that doesn't really seem to be the case either. Here we look at uh, the number of per capita church membership. Um, and here we do see a small uptick, you know, beginning in the 1970s, um, but one that is small and not statistically significant. Okay. Um, so what I want you to take away from that is uh, test of channels seem to suggest that this is a story about the effect conservative shift being driven by the spread of capital intensive agriculture, as opposed to some potential alternative channels. Okay. Um, finally, we can look at contemporary policy preferences to study the poli political legacy of this post-war irrigation technology shock. Okay. We can't provide temp sort of time series evidence on this since we don't have good high resolution data on policy preferences prior to the irrig irrigation technology shock of the 1940s. Uh, but do we do have a lot of data from the co cooperative congressional election surveys, which are uh, carried out with thousands of respondents every year from 2006 to 2020, uh, which asks respondents uh, in nationally representative samples uh, about their policy preferences on a range of issues. This gives us a good number of respondents living around the Ogallala Aquifer and the Great Plains. And so we can compare the reported contemporary policy preferences of people living just inside the Ogallala Aquifer versus those living just outside. Um, and we will look at preferences concerning um, the three, well, three different issues, uh, regulation, um, tax and spending policies, and then issues that we might think of as pertaining to the culture wars. So this is just to show you uh, what we're comparing here, where we can geocode respondents down to the zip code level, and we're gonna compare the reported policy preferences of individuals living in zip codes outside versus inside of the Ogallala Aquifer, controlling for year and sur uh, for survey waves uh, and year fixed effects. Uh, and again, we're gonna look at different specifications which prune the sample to increasingly small bandwidths around the outer boundary of the Ogallala Aquifer. Okay, so we're comparing people just inside versus just outside. Okay, um, since we're you know running out of time, I, I won't belabor this, um, but let me just summarize what this table says. It basically shows that people living just inside the Ogallala Aquifer are systematically more conservative in their reported policy preferences than people living outside. Um, they're more likely to oppose uh, environmental regulation, more likely to support repealing the Affordable Care Act, more likely to support um, not finding employers for hiring undocumented labor, um, more likely to support uh, banning immigrants from access to public, public services, uh, more likely to oppose taxes, uh, more likely to oppose, uh, more likely to support cutting the welfare state. Um, something that's pretty interesting is on cultural issues, there are also some differences, um, especially when it comes to abortion. So they're more likely to support uh, uh, never giving a woman the right to choose to have an abortion beyond a certain um, period in her pregnancy. Uh, when it comes to background checks for guns or affirmative action, um, the differences seem to be smaller. So there are big differences in economic policy preferences, which are systematically more conservative among people living inside the boundaries of the Ogallala Aquifer. Uh, where this technological shock had the biggest impact. But there seems to have been also some spillover onto some cultural um, issues. Um, it's an interesting um, and perhaps a feedback effect of the increasing conservatism of these areas and Republican Party messaging. Yeah.
Um, so I know that's a lot of uh, information I've given you. So let me just conclude with what I think are some of the big picture takeaways. Um, I think in this paper, we offer a new explanation for the rise of rural conservatism that doesn't hinge on sort of distraction by cultural issues, but is instead perfectly consistent with economic self-interest. Um, what we find is that the post-war technology shock revolutionized agriculture and the Great Plains, uh, making it increasingly capital intensive and contributing to the emergence of new upwardly mobile farmers and agribusiness interests. The growing economic and political power of these interests in rural areas, we argue, has contributed to conservative transformation of rural political preferences. And in this way, new technologies made new politics in the Great Plains. Um, we obviously look at a specific case, um, one that's important because you know Kansas and the Great Plains have been so central to this debate. Uh, but we also think that you know you can see analogous dynamics in other parts of the country, um, in California's Central Valley, uh, in the Midwest, as agriculture has increased in scale and become increasingly capital intensive. Um, it's become increasingly conservative in its political orientation. Um, I would even conjecture this is a story that potentially extends beyond the United States to other cap advanced capitalist economies. Uh, but I'd be happy to talk about these kind of external validity issues in the discussion. Um, so with that, I'll end here. And thanks so much for your attention. Okay, thanks, Adi. That, that was extremely interesting from my perspective anyway. Uh, so as I said, uh, initially we have a formal discussant, uh, Brian Leonard from Arizona State. All right, thanks, Jeff, and, and thank you, Adi. I, I really enjoyed uh, having the opportunity to, to read this paper and kind of a, a good reason to engage with it deeply. It was a really fun paper to read and really well-written and uh, touches on a lot of my interest in both land use and uh, water so and economic history, so it was a pleasure. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll just <clears throat> kind of briefly summarize how I saw the paper and then, and then try to offer a few comments. So. Uh, in my mind, the kind of key motivating research question, right, is trying to understand why rural areas tend to be strongholds of conservatism today. And that question is particularly interesting given the historical context in the paper uh, that this hasn't always been the case, right? So why, why is it that we have this association between uh, rural areas and conservatism now when it didn't used to be the case? And then this paper is going to focus specifically on the role of technological and economic change in affecting political preferences within rural areas. Um, and we'll get into this in a moment, but I think there's a, a kind of a key distinction uh, between the level at which these two research questions are operating. So what this paper is gonna do, right, just in, in a nutshell, just to summarize again, is compare political preferences before versus after certain agricultural areas are exposed to a big major productivity shock. Uh, the time series variation for that shock is gonna come from the invention of gas uh, groundwater pumps and center pivot irrigation and then the cross-sectional variation is going to come from whether you have access to this massive aquifer or not and the key finding of the paper is that counties with aquifer overlap became more conservative after this technology shock and that these same areas see important productivity shocks in agriculture that are associated with the more intensive use of two key inputs which would be water uh, and the capital that's necessary to extract that water and we'll, we'll talk about that more a little bit later um, so in terms of contributions of this paper, um, I think it offers some really nice new insights on the political consequences of technological change and productivity shocks in agriculture. And I think this is potentially really interesting because sort of in, in, in my neck of the woods in the world of environmental and resource and ag economists, a lot of folks are spending a lot of effort thinking about the relationship between climate change and agriculture and productivity and how technology might mediate the relationship between climate and productivity. And so I think also bringing in kind of the political consequences of productivity shocks in agriculture and thinking about the political economy of technological change could be really important as we think about like what is climate change going to mean for agriculture moving forward. I also think um, that this paper in particular relates to this new and emerging literature that tries to grapple with or understand the historical foundations of the modern political landscape in America. Um, and I didn't see that connection as discussed as much in the paper, but to me, this was like a really obvious connection. So two papers I would mention that we'll come back to in a moment um, are this kind of now infamous paper by Bozzi and co-authors about frontier culture and rugged individualism. The sort of part two paper shows that these places that have uh, sort of more frontier experience in the 19th century 
have less stringent COVID policy today and less compliance with those policies. So there's this clear link between historical experience and modern politics. And then there's a new working paper by uh, Samuel Bazzi and other co-authors uh, looking at uh, Southern migration. Uh, so migration of white Southerners out of the South and how that maps onto rural conservatism today. And I'll come back to that paper in a moment, but I think that this paper uh, connects to those uh, in this nice sort of trying to understand the historical foundations of our modern political landscape. So I want to offer kind of three broad comments or maybe sets of comments with some sub points to them. Um, and we, if we run out of time in the, in, in the third one, that's okay. Um, first, I want to kind of challenge maybe a false equivalence between rural versus urban and agricultural uh, and think through what that means. Second, I want to talk a little bit more about sort of the specific findings in the context of agriculture and what those might mean. And then three, I want to offer some potential alternative explanations for the core finding. And, and let me say that I think the core finding in this paper, this change in conservative attitudes uh, associated with being on versus off the aquifer before versus after the advent of groundwater pumping is a really nice and really robust result uh, that comes through really cleanly. But here was something that I kind of struggled with as I read the paper. So the underlying thing we're trying to understand, right, if we just sort of put politics on our standard left right spectrum, we've got, you know, liberal, more left leaning politics, and then we've got this continuum down to more right wing politics. And the key motivating question, so this was research question number one, right, is why is it that today in America and in many sort of developed countries, there's this association between rural areas and conservative politics or this rural urban divide that folks talk about. So that's kind of the motivating question in the paper. But then the identifying variation in the natural experiment is going to compare or find that the key result of the paper is going to be that places that had access to the aquifer experienced this conservative shift relative to places that didn't have access to the aquifer, right? But I think this creates a little bit of a challenge or for me a little bit of a disconnect because at the end of the day, this identifying variation that's driving the empirical exercise is essentially going to be orthogonal to this rural urban divide, right? So this is borrowing from figure seven in the paper, or maybe I guess it's figure eight in the paper. Uh, and as Adi just told us, there's not really any impact on population density. And there's sort of a late and small increase in urbanization, but it comes several decades after sort of the initial findings on rightward shifts in politics. So if I were to redraw this figure, I would sort of draw it this way, which is to say in this paper, the identifying variation is sort of aquifer access versus not, pre versus post, and that's what maps onto the difference in politics. But in this paper, that's basically orthogonal to the rural urban divide. So what I would say is that this paper is telling us something about how the transition to high value agriculture from low value agriculture has political consequences, which to me is a different question than what explains the rural urban divide in politics. And Adi, to his credit, and co-author recognized this in the paper. So this is pulled from page 33 of the paper, um, you know, basically saying this, this doesn't really tell us, you know, that this isn't driven by differences between rural and urban areas. It's more about understanding technological change within agricultural areas. And to me, this was just a little bit, I think, based on reading the introduction, I was expecting to see more of a rural versus urban story. I don't think that's what this paper is about, and I think that's okay, but I think maybe repackaging it so that you don't fail to deliver on that promise. Another way of sort of characterizing it would be with this kind of sort of two by two, you could think about having counties that are more urban and more rural, and you could think about having counties that have access to the aquifer versus not. And I think mostly this paper kind of lives in the second column, which is finding that places that transition to high value agriculture become more conservative within rural areas relative to places that don't make that transition, that don't become as conservative. So given that, I want to think about the importance of agriculture in explaining sort of this core finding in the paper. So this paper looks at several agricultural outcomes. Um, there's increases in the fraction of a county that's irrigated. There's increases in the number of center pivots. There's increases in farm values, and there's increases in the number of farms. This is closely related to two papers in the economics literature um, that I, I think you should take a look at, and I think could be really helpful. Um, so this Edwards and Smith paper in 2018 is addressing sort of a broader question about increases in water access in the mid 20th century, but I would say about half of their results are focused on essentially this exact pre-post 1940s on versus off aquifer comparison, 
They measure things like land value and crop value in slightly different ways that I think are maybe more natural to economists that might actually help you with uh, some precision in your results. So instead of looking at the average value of a farm, for instance, they look at land value per acre. Uh, they actually have a measure of irrigation capital per acre, like a, a monetized measure. So there's some things there that I think that I think could really help you. But at the end of the day, the upshot is the same, which is that being over the Ogallala Aquifer results in a large in, in this major positive productivity shock for agriculture. Right. Uh, a related, more recent paper that's in the Interdisciplinary Environmental Research Letters Journal. They find that having access to groundwater storage, i.e. being over the Ogallala, uh, makes places more resilient to drought in the late 20th century. So when you have a drought, uh, places that are sitting over the Ogallala see, see smaller declines in yields and acreage and things like this. And this leads to this long run diverging trend between these two regions. So to kind of bring all that together, again, there was a tension here for me, which is that the, the sort of historical narrative in the first half of the paper was the story about how technological change and being over the aquifer led to large scale business like farms and that these larger uh, sort of more profitable farms uh, lead to this shift in political preferences. To me, that's a little bit at odd with what the empirical evidence, both in this paper and in the Edwards and Smith work actually shows, which is that so so if I take the result from this paper, uh, kind of the key result or one of the key results in figure seven uh, is that being over the aquifer is associated with having uh, larger increases in farms per acre. So if we flip that relationship around, that means there are smaller farms. Because if you hold acreage constant, which is, you know, you've got county fixed effects in here. So we're holding differences in acreage between counties constant. You're actually seeing more small farms. That's equivalent to seeing more center pivots. Uh, and so ultimately what you're finding is that there are smaller, at least in terms of acreage, but more valuable farms. And in general, this is pretty consistent with kind of what we find in agricultural economics, which is that there's this inverse relationship between aridity, or I guess a positive relationship between aridity and farm size. So more arid areas tend to have larger farms, places where you can water more intensively, the efficient scale of farming is actually smaller. So to me, this still leaves us with a little bit of a puzzle, which is why are these areas that are characterized by more and higher value farms characterized by more conservative political preferences? And one question that I had that I wonder if you can get out with the empirics at all is whose preferences are changing? Is it the farmers themselves? And we maybe we have more farmers and these farmers are more profitable uh, and their preferences are cha changing. Is it the winner's preferences, in other words? Or are there folks that are somehow losing out from this sort of consolidation or, or business-like, you know, farms becoming more business-like? Are there losers? And is it more of a conservative backlash to that change? I think trying to understand that might be really interested, interesting. Um, I really liked sort of the survey-based evidence at the end of the paper linking to pro-business policy and thinking about how that might map onto these changes. Um, but I wanted to suggest sort of three possible kind of alternative explanations or alternative mechanisms, let's say, um, that you might be able to explore at relatively low cost, I think. So the first relates to common pool resource governance um, and how that sort of maps onto the variation you're looking at. The second is this recent paper by Bozzi and co-authors on the, on the Southern migration. And then the final one is one you mentioned in the paper sort of in the narrative history, which is exposure to New Deal programs. So I'll try to run through these very, very quickly. Um, and then hopefully we can have uh, plenty of time to talk about it. So one key difference between these places that are over the aquifer versus not in what happens with the shock is that you get this massive collective action, common pool resource problem as a result of groundwater pumping. So it's a classic, you know, everybody shares the same aquifer. I'm going to stick my straw in and drink your milkshake. Milkshake. It's a classic problem, right? Um, where management does exist in these areas, and there's not a lot of groundwater management, but where it does exist, at least according to Eric Edwards, who's sort of my groundwater guru, it's pretty bottom up. There's not a lot of top down policy to manage these aquifers. It's closer to kind of bottom up Ostromy type arrangements that then get codified into uh, formal local political institutions. I think this could be really interesting. And I asked some of my sort of more Ostrom focused friends, and this was the closest thing I could come up with to this in the literature. There's this paper in the JPE in 2020 that finds that places that have more communal values are associated with uh, more conservative politics, particularly in rural America. And so I guess what I'm wondering here is if perhaps there's this story where 
exposure to this common pool dilemma, which is a big deal. I mean, highlighting, you know, highlighted by the farm values that you're looking at in this paper, like this is the big deal in this region is this common pool resource dilemma. Uh, some places then sort of are forced to develop these communal institutions to manage this dilemma. And could that be associated with a rightward shift in policy? This is armchair theorizing about politics from an economist. So I realize, uh, you know, we're kind of making it up as we go, but it might be worth looking into. And, and one thing that I think that could be really neat about this and, and lend it to, to some pretty nice tests is that Edwards 2016 finds that the benefits of adopting management really vary based on the sort of exogenous geologic characteristics of the aquifer. So within the aquifer, there's areas that are more connected where your neighbor's behavior affects you more uh, and places where recharge occurs more rapidly. So adopting institutions could have uh, sort of a larger benefit. So there might be some really nice sort of exogenous variation in the extent of the collective action problem within the aquifer that would allow you to explore this as a possible mechanism. The second one I wanted to mention is this new paper by Bozzi and co-authors on what they call the other great migration, which is a bunch of white southerners sort of leaving the south in the early 20th century. Two things struck me as interesting as I was reading this paper, reading your paper and, and reminded of this paper. One is that their kind of key explanatory variable is the share of white southerners living in a county in 1940. So the timing is pretty similar. The other, if we just do like a quick kind of eyeball ocular regression here, is that if I kind of focus in on the Great Plains, it's at least suggestive that some of the areas that are over the aquifer might actually have a larger share of white southerners. I'm not sure why that could be. It might have something to do with in-migration or out-migration before versus after the Dust Bowl. I'm not particularly sure, but this just struck me as, th this was sort of the other paper that was looming large in my mind as trying to explain rural conservatism in modern America. And so I just wondered if there's some sort of relationship here and the timing is also somewhat suggestive. Last sort of uh, harebrained alternative mechanism, and then I'll stop but I wanted to think about kind of New Deal spending in particular. So um, Sean Cantor and Price Fishback and some other co-authors have like a dozen different papers about the New Deal and how it affected everything you can think of, leveraging a really nice county level data set they built on New Deal expenditures. One of their papers from 2013 finds that the New Deal um, played an important role in sort of solidifying this democratic realignment in politics again, in the 1940s and onwards. So again, the timing is, is very suggestive, right? The New Deal spending is all occurring in the 1930s, which is pretty close to sort of the key timing of treatment in your setting. And so then I just kind of was curious, I wonder how New Deal spending kind of maps onto aquifer access versus not. One of the big agricultural pieces of the New Deal was the Conservation Reserve Program, which is paying people to pull land out of agriculture, which of course is concentrated in low value areas off of the aquifer. Um, so just did a few kind of quick back of the envelope type of things. Um, so here you're looking at darker areas, uh, got more New Deal spending, lighter areas got less. Um, just a really simple, very naive linear regression with state fixed effects would suggest that having a 1% increase in aquifer coverage leads to about a $9,000 decrease in New Deal spending in a county. So it's at least plausible or possible that the New Deal somehow played a role in this political shift. And I, I think the thing that got me thinking about this was um, your result that it, it, you know, it seems like the effect is concentrated in federal politics. And so I was thinking through what are the federal policies that could really matter in this place at this time? Uh, and the New Deal is obviously one that kind of looms large. So that's enough armchair theorizing from The Economist. So just to sum up, I think this is a really, really nice empirical design. It's, it's really clean. I think obviously the data work is, is fantastic and very impressive. And this core result about the shift in politics is, for me, was somewhat surprising. And I, I found it to be very compelling and very robust. Um, as I was reading the paper, I found the narrative history to be somewhat at odds with what's in the empirical evidence. Um, both when I read the paper, I thought, is that true? Is that true? Like that's kind of inconsistent with some, some things that I remember from the literature, for example, the Edwards and Smith work. And then when we get to your results, in fact, some of these statements about large, small, large farms versus small farms, they just seem kind of intention. Um, and I think just cleaning that up might be helpful. Um, and again, I think the paper could be strengthened to, uh, strengthened by connecting more strongly to this literature on kind of the historical foundations of modern political economy.
because uh, I think that seems to be this literature that's kind of exploding. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be about the rural urban divide so much as explaining uh, just sort of more broadly the variation in uh, modern political economy. But I'll go ahead and, and leave it at that so that other folks have time to ask questions. Excellent, Brian. Thanks very much. It was terrific. Um, so usually we, 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 we start with uh, giving the presenter some opportunity to respond. Uh, Adi, do you have some thoughts on, on Brian's comments? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, like, wow, like, thank you for uh, the super thoughtful comments. Um, you know, I've presented this a few times and uh, uh, you raised a number of points that, you know, I hadn't thought about before. So those comments are really thought provoking. Um, I more or less agree with, you know, every, every point you made. Um, you know, in terms of framing, I agree, we're kind of trying to thread this needle where we want to speak to this broad question about, um, you know, the broad rural urban divide in contemporary politics. But I agree, ultimately, well, you know, our argument is more rural sector focused, right? And so our empirics within the rural sector, you know, why do you go from relatively centrist to conservative? Um, uh, comparing places that were more or less exposed to this technological shock. Um, on scale, um, yeah, I take your point. Um, I guess in terms of in scale, we were thinking less in terms of like acreage than in terms of like capitalized value of farms. Um, but that would be a valuable thing to clarify that, um, yeah, like you could have these large, I mean, like the family farms and homesteads they may have actually been quite large in acreage, right? But quite unproductive in terms of um, like their their market value or their productivity. Um, so that is something we should address more squarely. Um, I take that point. Um, exposure to, you know, like, you know, is there a common pool resource issue here? I think that's a really interesting idea. Um, you know, I was reading about some of these groundwater management districts. Um, membership in these groundwater management districts is often restricted to uh, farmers with land holdings above a certain size. So, you know, one of the storylines we've been thinking about, about why these like agribusiness interests exert so much influence in rural areas uh, is do they somehow sort of capture rural interest articulation organizations? You could think something about, you could potentially tell some kind of a story about groundwater management districts and associations as being these kind of rural institutions that kind of disproportionately get captured by affluent farmers. Um, there's a storyline like that out there. Um, or that's kind of the direction in which I'm thinking, but, but that's a good, good suggestion. Um, and on the other papers, um, those are good confounders and alternative storylines we should look at. And, We'll try and measure and control for those things. Yep. But thanks so much for the comments. My pleasure. Any follow-up thoughts, Brian? One thing, it's sort of related to the, the farm size issue. Just in, in thinking through this, I mean, when you look at when you look at your map of center pivots, they're almost all, I mean, you can see they're either sections or quarter sections, and most of them are quarter sections, which would be a homestead. And so I think. I think just and anecdotally, like from what I know about this region, I think more of what's going on is that there's probably not a lot of change in farm size on the aquifer so much as off of the aquifer, you're having more homesteads fail and get consolidated into larger farms. So Gary Livecap has some work on, on farm failure in the Dust Bowl and then consolidation that happened as a result. And it's really focused on the upper Great Plains. So like north of your treated area. And so I just, you know, I'm not, again, I think you're right to focus on capitalized value more than acreage. And I think maybe just clarifying that distinction um, might be useful because I think the changes in like physical farm size are perhaps not super dramatic over the aquifer. Just give like, if you look at a map, you can literally see that like, oh yeah, these are still a bunch of individual quarter sections. Now there's a question of how many of those are aggregated into a single farm. But I think the, the returns to scale, spatial scale are, kind of constrained by the fact that the center pivots themselves are this fixed size, but that's just a, a kind of a detail to clean things up. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, I have I have a few questions. Uh, some mm -hmm. are some are more just, you know, again, city boy, like asking questions about this. Um, 
and, and just not knowing. Um, some are more kind of just fact, factual questions, historical questions, but some of them also touch on uh, some of the things that Brian mentioned in his comments. So um, an aquifer is, is obviously uh, in the ground, right? What are, what are the property rights with regard to the aquifer? If you have land above an aquifer, do you have rights to tap the aquifer? Is that how it works? So property rights regimes differ. Um, I think actually, I mean, Brian could probably know this better than I would, but in the, I guess in these states, it's primarily, yes, if you own the land, you have access to the um, water underneath. In, in some states, there's a prior use kind of priority thing, but yeah, for the most part, I think that's the case, yeah. Is that right, Brian? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And and are there are there real differences across the the, the states that bound the aquifer on this matter? I don't know, Brian. What is the boundary at which like this uh, these property rights laws typically change? There's like it's, a... it's sort of just west of where you're... so you know Wyoming, Colorado, New Mexico are going to have for surface water they're going to have a priority based system. Um, which more recently has kind of interacted with groundwater rules as sort of the connectivity between surface and groundwater resources has become more of an issue. But I think like at the time you're looking at, that's kind of not, like in the 1950s, nobody's worried about how groundwater rights are impairing surface water users. But once that becomes an issue in those priority-based states, then there's gonna be some prioritization based on when you drilled your well. Um, you'd have stronger a stronger claim to the water if you drilled your well earlier, kind of a thing. And is you know so so when we think about the aquifer, um, is this a is this a resource that is going to last several decades, a century, century and a half? I mean, how how long can you tap that water? Um, so my impression is it, it varies quite a bit. Um, there are parts of the aquifer that have already dried up pretty much like uh, the water is so far, like the, the saturated thickness of the aquifer is so low that basically it's not worth it to irrigate from those areas. Um, there are areas where it's still like quite robust, like in Nebraska and, you know, for the coming decades, you could expect to continue to use that water. Um, but it's, it's, it's a kind of localized thing that varies from portion to portion of the aquifer, I guess. So for particular areas, they could still be irrigating. Uh, yeah. And yet the cost of doing business has increased over time because they're having to dig deeper or, or pipe deeper. Mm -hmm. Is there any yeah. way to get a, a handle on that at all? Get a sense of that? And should that, um, affect, should that affect political preferences at all? I mean, potentially. I could imagine one channel in which it would, right? Um, you know, as the water, level, water tables fall, right? Um, there's increasing pressure to kind of meter and regulate groundwater usage. Um, opposition to metering and these groundwater districts is one of the kind of an important policy issue, I think, which has made some of the farmers on the Great Plains increasingly conservative because they don't want to meter water, they don't want to limit their use of uh, you know, the aquifer. So to the extent that that intensifies that conflict, you could imagine it yeah. making um, things more conservative. On the other hand, like if you looked at the, if you looked at the results on like the per farm market value, you know, over time, what you see is that it kind of peaks in the 1970s, 1980s, but it kind of dissipates over time. Um, one potential explanation for that is that like, basically this water resource is kind of dissipating and becoming costly to access. So these farms are not as valuable anymore. Um, that might operate in the, you know, in the other direction, right? Um, if these farms aren't big profit-making enterprises, um, perhaps they're less, they look less like big business and perhaps they become less conservative. Um, but that would be an interesting, you know, one could actually even think about trying to study that, right? Find yeah. areas of aquifer that are depleted and areas that are less so and see what happens, yeah. And then really think about it, you know, I was just thinking through this a little bit and thinking of it as a, you know, you might think of it as like an early Asimago and Johnson problem, right? Are you going to be in, are you going to invest or are you going to extract based upon how much you can get and what you can get 
from particular areas based upon your knowledge of, you know, how much water is there, how, di how deep you'd have to dig, all kinds of things. Hmm. Um, so if you're, so just so that I'm straight on this, so if, if you're not above the aquifer, you can't tap that water. Is that right? Um, for all practical purposes, um, no. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can you sell it if you're above the aquifer? I suppose you could. Um, I'm going to say I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to say I, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I actually don't know. Um, I, I would imagine it would, it would be costly. You know, um, one of the advantages of center pivot irrigation is you don't have to set up a complicated like irrigation system with pipes and things. You just have this centralized system. And so that's one reason I made it so popular. So if you were to like pipe water or transport it, that, that would come with its own cost. But um, so I would say, I don't think I know. I would guess you could, but it might be costly. Yeah. Okay. So one other, one other thing I was thinking about um, that's in line with what Brian was talking about was just, um, you know, over, the, over these, these decades, uh, you know, sort of migration patterns into and outside of the area that, you know, essentially overlaps with the, the aquifer and, and outside in areas just outside. Do we know much about that? So it sounds like there are a couple papers looking at Southerners, right? Moving to the area or potentially moving to the area. That might be sort of interesting to think about it. Do we know anything about, about um, the, the sale and acquisition of farmland within this area over those, over those decades? Um, it could be that, you know, are the same folks, are, are families buying up areas? And is that some reason to think that um, you might find more conservative politics because the same family units are effectively um, focused on the certain areas in that aquifer range? That would be an interesting thing to look at. So I guess what you're asking is, um, is this a storyline about um, selection, right, of people in and out of places, you know, over the aquifer, or is this a storyline about, you know, yeah, or like an existing population, yeah. the preferences of which are transformed, right? That's right. Yeah. Um, you know, I would imagine there's a bit of both. Um, you know, I I haven't looked at it empirically, but we we should. Um, but here's what I'm thinking. Um, you know, at least in these studies of Haskell County, right? Um, there is this kind of, um, you know, qualitative evidence that, um, you know, small farmers are kind of getting pushed out, right? So um, they like economies of scale and agriculture increase. It's no longer viable for small farms to survive. There's some consolidation and small farmers kind of move out. Um, actually, the discussion of Haskell County describes the county as fairly like, um, a fairly transient population, um, like people move in and people move out and like there's a fair bit of circulation. Um, so you could imagine that, that that might be something at work here. Um, so as agriculture becomes increasingly large scale, perhaps certain people select in and certain people select out. And with that comes a shift in the composition of preferences. Um, I would view that as a, you know, another channel to think about. Um, and of course, prior to this, there's the dust bowl Right, which led to a lot of out migration. Um, we we compute a measure of exposure to the dust bowl um, based on sort of share of county lands that had severe wind erosion, um, and our results seem to be robust to that. Um, but apart from controlling, I, I think that's a good point. That's a kind of selection effects are an interesting channel through which um, some of the story could be operating. Okay, that's all I have. <laughs> so Brian, if you have any other thoughts. So I, I just have a really naive question um, that as an economist, I just, I, I didn't know the answer to, but does Republican vote share mean the same thing in the 1920s that it does today or in the 1980s? Like are the actual policy preferences the same? Like to what extent do we need to worry that like the policy preferences represented by the Republican party are not stationary? Yeah, um, so that is a concern, right? I, obviously, in the intervening period, there was this uh, realignment, especially in the in the south, right? 
Um, my understanding of that realignment is that it's primarily on racial and social issues. Uh, but when it comes to the kind of economic dimension of left-right competition, the Republican Party has remained the kind of like party of the right mm -hmm. um, over this period. Um, but, but I don't know issue, if Jeff would disagree. I mean, the issue is what does the party of the right mean? What does the right mean, right? Because yeah. uh, what is what is the, the left and the right on a particular issue? So the Republican Party in the 1920s and 1930s was, um, you know, still a largely protectionist party, right? And 50, 60, 70 years later, become free traders. And now it's kind of beginning to tilt a little bit more toward protection again, right? So what is what is the conservative position on um, on trade over time? Well, that's a, that's a, that's kind of a, a social construct a bit, right? There is no conservative position. The conservative position and what that is, is, you know, essentially what we decide it is in, in different periods of time. So uh, that would be, that would be a potential thing to think about a little bit, right? What are some of the issues that are uh, crucially important to uh, farming in the Great Plains area? And has the Republican Party position on those issues changed over time? Mm. Maybe a bit, right? Yeah, that, that's a good point. Um, and, you know, it, it, it is kind of consistent with the empirics. Um, you know, when we do these decade by decade associations between aquifer coverage and your Republican vote share, it's a association that grows over time. It doesn't emerge all at once, right, uh, post-World War II. Um, there's two potential explanations for that, at least. Um, one is that this technological change was a gradual process that, you know, increased over time. Another one is that actually there's some shifting of party positioning, right? That given a certain set of like uh, farming and agribusiness interests that emerge in these places, if the Republican party is moving in a direction that's more consonant with their interests, you'd expect that that coefficient to grow. Yeah. Um, and you do kind of see the spike in the 1980s, you know, around yep. 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 You know, Reagan and things. Um, yep. So, yeah. I mean, this is partially at the beginning anyway, kind of a media story as well, right? I mean, the Democrats really stake out uh, a different position during this time. Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, that, that's all I have, unless uh, either of you have anything more. This has been really interesting. This has been maybe my favorite one, this, to this point. And this is four and a half years into doing this, right? This is touching on all the, all the things that I care about and I'm interested in, at least at this point in my career. Um, so I'll thank Adi for presenting. Uh, I'll thank Brian for providing great comments. I'll thank you both for the chance to meet you virtually, at least. I was going to say in person. It's kind of in person, right? Virtually at this stage. Yep. <laughs> uh, this might be the only stage we have in, 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 in the near future, but we'll see. Uh, thanks to uh, Ann Johnson and Aubrey Hicks at the Bedrosian Center, as always. And sadly, this is uh, Aubrey Hicks's last pipe workshop. She is leaving USC and the Bedrosian Center on to bigger and better things. Uh, and uh, with that, I will uh, thank everyone out there for spending part of their uh, Tuesday afternoon with us and uh, look for this workshop to be up on social media, up on YouTube in the next couple of days. Thanks very much. Well, 